The final item of business is members' business debate on motion 16671 in the name of Claire Baker on the Open University Act 50. And this debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Claire Baker to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I am honoured to open this evening's debate celebrating 50 years of the Open University. I would like to thank all members from across the Chamber for supporting the motion and also invite everyone to the reception tomorrow evening to further celebrate the positive impact of the Open University for individuals and communities across Scotland and the UK. It is over 55 years since Harold Wilson's powerful speech to a Labour conference in Glasgow on the white heat of technology. In that speech, he talked about expansion in higher and further education and expanded on plans for a university of the air. He described the changing nature of industry, just as we now recognise the changing economy we have inherited. In government, Wilson understood that rapid change brings challenges for the workforce and society. And it was also a government which promoted the importance of social mobility. Today is exactly 50 years since the Open University was given its Royal Charter. It might have been the idea of Harold Wilson, but it was the job of Jenny Lee, then Minister for the Arts, to deliver it. As an MSP for Miss Scotland and Fife, I am very proud to be related to Jenny Lee and welcome that her contribution as an MP and in government is increasingly being recognised, including in the celebrations of the Open University's 50th birthday. Delivering the Open University wasn't all plain sailing. It was a radical idea that challenged tradition and privilege. But Jenny Lee was determined and tenacious in her pursuit of this vision. No doubt driven by her experience growing up in Fife, during a time when for many life was very hard and educational opportunity was limited, Jenny committed herself wholeheartedly to this project. In 1973, laying the foundation stone for the first OU library, she described it as a great independent university which does not insult any man or woman, whatever their background, by offering them the second best, Nothing but the best is good enough. And that is the quality that the Open University has been delivering for 50 years. It serves students across the whole of Scotland, opening up opportunities for everyone, regardless of background, current circumstances or geography. Its flexible approach to study supports the ambitions of, for example, people who have caring responsibilities, people with disabilities or those living in remote or rural locations. There are almost 16,500 students across every part of Scotland, with over 1,800 in my own region. Entry to our universities is increasingly competitive, and while we are seeing some contextualisation of entrance qualifications, there are challenging minimum entry thresholds. The Open University maintains an open entry policy, meaning no previous qualifications are required for the vast majority of courses. This is as radical a notion today as it was 50 years ago, and challenges our perceived wisdom about a student's potential and ability to succeed. This approach of the Open University is egalitarian. It doesn't matter what school the student went to, what age they are, where they live. It is open to all. This was pretty radical. To open up the opportunities of higher education and the possibilities that come with that was an important legacy of a reforming Labour government that is still going strong today. Three quarters of OU students are in work, while two thirds earn less than £25,000 a year. 22% of students declare a disability and almost a fifth don't have a traditional university entrance qualifications. This student profile is unique. It is one that reflects the desire to benefit from education from all sections of our society, and the OU provides the means to do so. Almost two thirds of OU and graduates in Scotland receive the part-time fee grant a percentage which has steadily grown since it was introduced six years ago and excludes those on lower incomes from paying fees. It can be argued that those who do pay fees are paying a significant lower rate than fees paid in English universities. But combined with part-time OU students not being entitled to maintenance support, we do need to be mindful that the financial costs of learning do not exclude people who are looking to benefit from this opportunity. And the forthcoming consultation on part-time study is welcome. While at its core, the Open University maintains its guiding principles, it has modernised. Growing up in the 1970s, I can remember glimpses of the late night OU programmes on the BBC, complicated equations, theories and lots of beards. But the internet has revolutionised the Open University. 
The free learning website OpenLearn has had more than 60 million visitors, while more than 8 million people have learned with FutureLearn. The OU has also fostered relationships with national and regional partners. Within my own region, Babcock International, Diageo, Fife Council, NHS Fife, SSC and Scottish Water all sponsor students, recognising that the benefit for the individual is also a huge benefit to the company who's employing them. And in addition, the Young Participants in Schools scheme enables six-year students to build skills and confidence by studying at degree level in their own schools and includes many schools across my region. At the inception of the Open University, Harold Wilson envisaged it within the context of a changing industrial landscape and the growth of new technology. We have recently had debates on the increasing need to consider the jobs of the future and the skills that people will need to succeed in them and in our future society. So the Open University is as relevant in this context as it's ever been. We have a rapidly changing economy and jobs market and we need to reinvigorate the critical importance of lifelong learning so that people in and out of work are prepared to adapt and thrive with the skills and knowledge that they need. I feel like there has been a contraction of these opportunities and we should take the opportunity of the significant birthday of the Open University to reaffirm the importance of lifelong learning and be clear about supporting policies which will deliver it. So to return to the beginning, the Royal Charter instructed the university to advance and disseminate learning and knowledge, an instruction you can expect to be issued to a university. However, it also placed the responsibility on the Open University to promote the educational well-being of the community generally, a much broader obligation, setting the OU on a social mission to make learning accessible to students and non-students alike. It is truly a university of the air, opening up education for all, extending opportunity to adult learners, and cementing the idea of lifelong learning and second chances. It is more than an educational institution. In his 1963 speech, Harold Wilson said, I believe a properly planned university of the air could make an immeasurable contribution to the cultural life of our country, to the enrichment of our standard of living. The Open University has achieved this and much more. Presiding officer, it's a pleasure to read this evening's debate and I wish the Open University and all its staff and its students a fantastic anniversary year and I'm confident there are many more to come in the future. Thank you. Can I first of all say to those in the gallery that it's inappropriate to show appreciation or otherwise. Thank you. And we move to the open speeches and speeches of four minutes, please. Uh, Annabel Ewing, followed by Oliver Mundell. <clears throat> Thank you, presiding officer. And I would like to congratulate Claire Baker on securing this debate tonight, marking the 50th anniversary of the Open University. For it is absolutely appropriate that we in this parliament should mark this momentous occasion. And in so doing, we are afforded the opportunity to commend the pioneering and indeed pivotal role of Jenny Lee in securing the establishment of the Open University. And this was in fact against a backdrop of opposition and scepticism from many of her colleagues and indeed uh, much of the civil service at the time in the House of Commons, although Jenny Lee did have an important ally as her relative Claire Baker pointed out, the then Prime Minister, Harold Wilson. And as M MSP for Cowton Beath constituency, I can say that my constituents are rightly very proud of Jenny Lee, who was born in Loch Gailey and was the ducks of Beath High School and indeed started her political career as an MP for North Lanarkshire representing at that time the independent Labour Party in Scotland. Presiding officer, as we have heard, the Royal Charter establishing the Open University, which was granted on 23rd of April 1969, indeed tasked the Open University, and I quote, to promote the educational well-being of the community generally. And it is that wide remit that is at the very heart of the unique role of the Open University. For indeed, it is not just about the promotion of learning and knowledge, it is also about ensuring that everyone has the opportunity to realise their potential through education. And it really is a university that is open to all ages and that is open to all backgrounds and that is open all of the time. And no entrance qualifications are required and students can indeed study 
anywhere, the Open University being the first university in the United Kingdom to facilitate distance learning. Initially, and I do remember as well, as my colleague Claire Baker, by use of the television, and it was always very interesting to try to puzzle out what was uh, being shown to you late night on the television, but also by means of radio and correspondence, and then, of course, by online learning. Some 200,000 Scottish students have studied uh, through the Open University over the last 50 years, and I think this statistic demonstrates quite simply how effective the Open University has been in widening access to tertiary education. As far as my own constituency of Cowdenbeath is concerned, I was pleased to note that take-up is in fact above the Scottish average. And at the same time, uh, nearly three quarters of those studying in my constituency are in fact in work. The accessibility of the Open University is also uh, underscored by the fact that around a fifth of the students have a disability. And it is heartening to note that as far as gender balance in STEM subjects is concerned, that uh, is nearly uh, 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 being achieved and I'm so sure will be uh, achieved uh, in short order. Uh, on financial accessibility, um, we have heard that this is encouraged by the fact that Open University students can be classed as part-time students <coughs> and so have access to a means-tested fee grant. Additionally, the Open University's Open Learn platform makes some 5% of all course material available for free on their website so people can see if a course is likely to be for them or not. And also locally, it is good to note that it is possible to study Open University courses at Fife College. Presiding officer, as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of this wonderful institution, I would like to pay tribute to Jenny Lee and to all who have worked so hard over the last five decades to make such a success of this unique educational institution. I would also wish to take the opportunity to recommend the Open University to any of my constituents who are interested in broadening their education and in improving their qualifications, whether that is for personal development or for the development of their careers. Thank you, presiding officer. Oliver Mundell, followed by Richard Leonard. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Can I begin by uh, joining other members in uh, congratulating Claire Baker on, supporting, on securing this important debate? Um, it's a great opportunity and I feel very privileged to take part and have the chance to say happy birthday uh, to one uh, of our most unique and precious educational uh, resources. The Open uh, University has been pushing the case for excellence and equity in education uh, since long before it was fashionable. And I think there are many people right across uh, Scotland and throughout the United Kingdom who are very grateful for the opportunities the Open University has given them. Um, its values are right at the heart um, of uh, what we are trying to do in, in Scottish education uh, right now. Its uh, mission statement and uh, the work it's doing is, is as important today as it was 50 years ago. And it seems kind of strange to be talking about an organisation at 50 uh, that feels as if it's, it's still coming of age and still uh, just as relevant and disruptive uh, to the kind of traditional ideas of education, still as radical uh, right now. Um, and, 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 and I think the Open University, particularly in rural and remote areas in uh, my own constituency, I, I think uh, they're still doing a huge job of work uh, to push uh, other organisations and institutions uh, to think about uh, how they do things uh, to develop um, online and distance learning. Um, and I think most of all, the Open University is a great uh, avenue of learning uh, for non-traditional students, uh, students who've sometimes uh, missed out on, on other opportunities um, or who uh, have work or caring responsibilities. And I think uh, that provides a great uh, levelling force uh, in the educational uh, playing field. And I think uh, more than uh, anything, um, I, th I think it challenges people uh, to think again about what university and study means. Um, I've met constituents who've benefited uh, from uh, career changes um, and uh, who, who feel uh, that as the employment and uh, educational market has changed, uh, that uh, the Open Universities uh, provided them with an opportunity to avoid stagnation uh, and make the most uh, of, of their career and adjust their skills uh, for a changing economy. 
Um, I also know that there are many veterans uh, who have uh, come out of military service um, and that uh, the Open University currently has uh, 2,000 uh, former uh, service personnel as students. Um, and I think that's uh, greatly uh, to their credit. Again, uh, it lays down uh, a marker uh, for others. I'm also particularly interested in the partnerships uh, that the Open University has developed with schools uh, and with uh, businesses, um, with uh, subject choice uh, continuing to rumble on um, as a part of the educational debate and big challenges um, across the country. Again, uh, I'm certainly aware of many uh, young people in uh, my own constituency uh, who've benefited from opportunities uh, that the Open University have been able uh, to, to, to give them uh, to, 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 to take an interest in subjects that might otherwise have been unavailable. Um, and I, th I think it is through um, embracing uh, new technology and innovative forms of learning uh, that they've kept very much uh, up to date and continued to reinvent themselves. I'm too young uh, to remember the days of uh, things, things on television, uh, but I've certainly uh, been aware uh, of the huge expansion and, and of, of those resources since they've moved online. Um, and I'm confident that we'll be here in another 50 years. Well, hopefully uh, I will, presiding officer, uh, talking about the success uh, of uh, the Open University across the next half century. So thank you. Richard Leonard, followed by Kenneth Gibson. Uh, can I thank Claire Baker for tabling this important parliamentary debate? The Open University stands as one of the Labour Party's greatest achievements. It has close associations with Scotland, with Jenny Lee, its driving force, and Walter Perry, its first Vice-Chancellor. And whilst Harold Wilson later claimed that the plan for it was drafted between church and lunch on Easter Sunday in 1953, it was, as Claire Baker has said, in Glasgow in September 1963, that the idea of a University of the Air was publicly launched. So these Scottish connections are strong, but we should not let that submerge the fact, and I make no apology for saying that this is a distinctively Labour idea in its origin, with roots going back through the rich traditions of the Labour movement, from Chartism through the Clarion Clubs, to the Workers' Educational Association, the ILP summer schools, and the left book clubs of the 1930s, and born of an unswerving belief that education was liberation. Not education reduced simply to serving the needs of the economy or the demands of the labour market, but a belief in the conception of the OU's chief architect, Michael Young, of education as not merely a stepping stone or a sorting device, but as a good in itself, serving the general growth of humanity. Wilson's best biographer, Ben Pimlet wrote, it was a brilliantly original and highly ambitious institution which took the ideals of social equality and equality of opportunity more seriously than any other part of the British education system. And Tony Benn later said that Wilson was the real driving force behind it. He willed it. It was therefore unstoppable. But it was Jenny Lee, the first minister of the arts in British history, another Labour achievement, who was given the task of bringing it to fruition. The 1966 Labour election manifesto called Time for Decision, because the country was at a turning point, uh, contained a section headed Educational Opportunities for All and the pledge to, I quote, give everyone, everyone the possibility of study for a full degree. And with the election won, the mandate was secured. As Patricia Hollis wrote in Jenny Lee, A Life, it was an independent project, neither enriched nor constrained by whatever else was going on in further and higher education, superimposed on the department's priorities, led by a junior minister with no reputation in education and with no educational support behind her, and which at best drew a studiously neutral response from her Secretary of State who privately wished the scheme would disappear. Jenny Lee overcame all of this with passion and principle. She battled in Parliament, even in the Cabinet, 
and she defeated vested interests and naked class prejudice outside it to ensure that this was a university open in access, uncompromising in its standards. It has undergone a difficult few years recently. Cuts and staff casualisation have had to be resisted by the OU's many supporters, by its students, its former students, and the university and college union. And that is precisely because it remains a university worth fighting for, with teaching methods worth defending, built on an idea worth standing up for. Passionate unity in action is how Michael Foote summed up the political life of Jenny Lee. This is her greatest triumph. And along with the National Health Service, this is Labour's most enduring legacy. And we should mark today's anniversary by refreshing the ambition and the vision which it heralded. Can I remind those in the public gallery that they shouldn't be clapping or cheering or jeering or anything at all? <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to have Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Liz Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'm pleased to celebrate 50 years of the Open University and congratulate Claire Baker on bringing this debate to the Chamber today. The Open University is not only world-renowned as an excellent educational resource, it is widely known for its unparalleled accessibility and inclusivity. For half a century, the OU has enabled and empowered many people unable to study at a traditional institution to pursue higher education. And we must recognise the leading role of then Minister for the Arts, Jenny Lee, in establishing the OU and her determination to carry it through. Uh, the latest figures published by the OU showed that 37% of the 217 students who live in my county and North constituency are from the 20% most deprived backgrounds and 52% from the most deprived 40%. Further demonstrating the OU's rightful reputation for broadening access to education, 71% of students in my constituency are currently in employment, while 27% have a disability and 70% are female. These figures show that no matter your situation, a job you need to maintain, a dependent you must care for, a disability that limits your mobility, with the Open University, nothing is out of reach. Last year, 40 pupils from Adrosan Academy, Laz Academy, and St Matthew's Academy in my constituency participated in the OU Young Applicants in School Scheme. This programme receives support from the Scottish Funding Council and allows the OU to offer fully funded places for S6 pupils from local authority schools undertaking 10 and 30 credit modules. With subjects ranging from science, engineering, business studies, IT and computing, arts, mathematics and languages, YAS has helped over 7,500 people across Scotland bridge a gap between school and university, college and employment encouraging independent learning and building confidence. Beyond the qualifications themselves, these courses equip young people with essential skills needed to succeed in their future career pathway. Over the past 50 years, more than 2 million people worldwide achieved their learning goals by studying with the Open University. Each will have their own unique story about the difference it made to their life. Indeed, I recall a friend studying biology at a Russell Group University who found the strict schedule of lectures and seminars to be unsustainable and out of step with how he learnt best. He left after just one year of study to work on an oil platform rescue boat, but felt he still had room to challenge himself academically. He completed a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics with the OU by fitting in modules around his duties on ship. Then when he returned to a life on land, his BSc opened doors to a professional career which would otherwise have been closed. That is just one example of how the OU's flexibility can change lives. As part of its year of celebration, the OU has released a series of photographs showcasing both the early days of its teaching and its contemporary students. Photographer Chris Floyd, who shot the portraits of current students, said he wanted people to look at this collection and think, that person looks like me. If there are people out there wondering how to follow themselves, I want them to see these photos and think, that could be me. Certainly these photos tell that story. From Tracy Thorpe studying modern languages while out at sea serving on a yacht crew, to Stephen Akpabio Klementowski gaining a BSc in social science while serving a 16-year sentence for drug smuggling, to Zara Alidina, who became the UK's youngest ever law graduate at 15 after a degree with the OU, to Karis Williamson, who has congenital muscular dystrophy and is working towards a BA Open Honours degree, the students photographed have each used the Open University to unlock opportunity. 
Of course, thanks to this SNP government, last year 60% of Scottish OU students received a part-time fee grant, and this can only have been made, made a positive difference to their education and hopefully their lives and careers. Presiding officer, thanks to the OU and this model of support, many people in Cunningham North and beyond are now studying, whereas deprivation, disability, a lack of time may have otherwise prevented them from taking up studies. I hope that this year of anniversary and celebration of the Open University will help raise its profile and spread the message that fuller study and higher education is an option for all, no matter where you live and who you are. And once again, I thank Claire Baker for bringing this debate to the Chamber. Uh, before I move on any further, there's still quite a few members who would like to speak in the debate. So I'd be happy to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. And I'd invite Claire Baker to move a motion without notice. Moved. Thank you very much. The question is that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? Good, pleased about that. <laughs> that is therefore agreed. And I call Liz Smith to be followed by Gillian Martin. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I wholeheartedly welcome this debate that's been brought to the Chamber by Claire Baker, not just because it affords us the opportunity to celebrate the past 50 years, but because it also affords us the opportunity to examine the crucial role which the Open University will play in a fast-changing university sector in the future. And can I put on record uh, the Parliament's thanks to Susan Stewart and all her officers in the way that she has uh, led these changes. Uh, I think it is a, a very crucial role, uh, certainly a very a challenging one, but her engagement with this Parliament, with parties from all different political perspectives, is second to none, and I'd like to thank her uh, for that. This is a debate, as uh, Claire Baker rightly said, uh, about everyone in Scotland who wishes to undertake uh, a degree, regardless of age, income, qualifications or geography. And in an educational world that is increasingly demanding greater flexibility and diversity, the Open University could hardly be in a more important part of that education system. This debate represents an excellent opportunity to celebrate the achievements of the past 50 years but also the many connections that the Open University has made within Scotland and beyond. Much has been said about the origins and the speech that Harold Wilson made in Glasgow about the University of the Air, and it was one very good speech. But it was a politician from Fife, and the previous speakers have mentioned a great deal, rightly so, about Jenny Lee, whose efforts have played the most pivotal role in its foundation. And it is right that we celebrate all that achievement. However, Jenny Lee was not the only female politician to have played an important role in the OU's early days. After the foundation in uh, 1969, the Heath government, very ill-advisedly, was thinking about making some cutbacks on public expending and that the OU might have to be closed down. That, however, was unthinkable for the then Education and Science Secretary, Margaret Thatcher, whose arguments for its retention won the day in her cabinet, and thank goodness for that. Nowadays, as Annabel Ewing, I think, was pointing out, uh, the Open University reaches across the whole of Scotland, uh, its Royal Charter, over 200,000 students in Scotland, and it is a great privilege for us as uh, members of this Parliament to represent so many people who participate so successfully in the Open University. It has a very positive role to play in widening access to higher and to further education for people in work or who have families, or who live in some of Scotland's most disadvantaged and most remote communities. And in each case, I have been particularly impressed by the quality of teaching that it provides. And it has also been ranked in the top three universities in Scotland for student satisfaction for every year that the National Student Survey has been in existence. And I think that is some fair achievement. Apart from the high academic standards of which it should be very proud, it adds diversity and flexibility for so many students, including those that members have spoken about who are more mature uh, and part-time workers as well. I think that's a very important part uh, of what the Open University can achieve. It has, of course, a very proud uh, history when it comes to uh, its deliberations about what the future should hold. I thought the recent uh, Love Part-Time campaign was an excellent example of that. And certainly, uh, I know Claire Baker will be uh, hosting tomorrow's event, I had the privilege, uh, as I think my colleague Ian Gray did uh, in previous years, to focus on just uh, the amount of time that the Open University can give to so many of the, the, the new approaches in education, and I'm sure tomorrow night's event will be a huge success. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, can I finish my remarks 
um, with uh, reiterating my thanks to Claire Baker um, and also to Susan Stewart and uh, to so many of our officers who I think have done an outstanding job and may I wish them every success in the future. Gillian Martin, followed by Ian Gray. Thank you, President Officer. I would also like to congratulate Claire Baker on, on securing this debate. And uh, that's the first time I've heard that she was actually related to, to Jenny Lee. Um, that's quite incredible. Um, whenever I think of the Open University, I think of the opportunity it's provided for those who have found uh, access to higher education difficult. Today, there's a lot of government policy associated with widening access. And in many ways, the OU have been ahead of, their ahead of its time. They have been successfully widening access for hundreds of thousands of students in Scotland for 50 years. And we'll all have our own family stories of, of the Open University. And I'd like to mention one member of my wider family who was an OU graduate, and that's my late father-in-law, David. My husband's father came from a family who had uh, never had anyone who'd been to uni, uh, like so many Scottish families in the 1950s and, and 60s. And despite being the ducks at school and having both the brains and the qualifications to get into uni, David was expected to get a job when he left school. David became a journalist in the local paper, married and had children. Uh, but a few years on with a young family and a full-time job at the Daily Record, he set his sights on going into the BBC. David knew that in order to make his ambitions a reality, he had to get a degree. Of course, in the, the late 60s, early 70s, there were no video recorders, much less the internet. So anyone working full time would also have to put in a night shift to watch open university programmes and study. And his family remember dad coming in from work then staying up most of the night just to go back to work again the next day. But on graduating from the OU armed with his degree, David progressed through the ranks of BBC Scotland and also achieved BAFTA success with his coverage of Pope John Paul's visit to Glasgow. The U Open University gave David that access to a fairly glittering career that might otherwise have been out of reach of a young father from a Motherwell mining family. And take David's story and multiply it by thousands of working class Scots and you have a fair idea of why the OU is held, held in such fond regard. All universities change people's lives, but the OU can change a whole family's social and economic trajectory and, a wide, and the wider social justice landscape. There are many OU graduates that had to combine study with family responsibilities or full-time jobs, or look to the OU because their background wasn't conducive to entering a conventional university. But the OU has also given access to thousands of students who also have physical mobility difficulties, as so many members have mentioned. It's not just a case of studying any time, but the OU allows a person to study anywhere in their own way and with the level of support that they need. The Open University's contribution to the rights of people with disabilities cannot be overstated and its contribution to those in rural communities miles from any other university campus um, is significant. And as been mentioned, Jenny Lee, the founder of Open University, was a pioneer. She's a Scottish hero and her legacy of pushing the boundaries of what's possible in education continues to this day and I imagine that she would be well impressed with the leadership of Susan Stewart, as am I. We know the OU is at the forefront of developing, um, uh, developing and using innovative technology like virtual reality to facilitate learning for all, to reach further and further out to make higher education possible for those who previously found access challenging, or those who are simply attracted to the high quality of the OU's offer. Presiding officer, the OU changed the lives of my husband's family and therefore indirectly touched mine and my children's and it continues to spread its influence all over Scotland. Happy birthday to them, and here's to another 50 years in which they will lead the way in widening access and changing lives. Ian Gray, followed by Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And let me add my congratulations to, to Claire Baker for bringing uh, this evening's debate, and also um, echo those words we've heard uh, of the pride of the labour movement in the idea of the Open University uh, and in Scotland's pride too uh, of the role that uh, we played through Jenny Lee and Walter Perry and indeed um, uh, the initial speech from Harold Wilson being made uh, in Glasgow in the creation of the institution of the Open University. And of course we should acknowledge and congratulate the institution and the idea of the Open University uh, but I think it's important, too, that we acknowledge the students uh, across those 50 years. 
The institution and the idea makes their study possible, uh, but it is the students and their determination which actually makes it happen. Uh, and, you know, as somebody who struggled sometimes with the self-discipline of studying at university in spite of uh, it really having everything laid on a plate uh, for me and the opportunity to study full time, uh, I am uh, constantly astonished uh, by those who, while working part time or sometimes full time, uh, are able to uh, study at the Open University, perhaps to uh, uh, upskill their, their qualifications for their job, uh, but often just for the love of learning and the subject that they're studying. Uh, or those who, with caring responsibilities or living with disability, still have the self-discipline, the determination to, uh, uh, to make their study work and succeed. I take my hat off uh, to those students, 200,000 Scots, as we've heard across the years, like Gillian Martin, my late father-in-law was one of them, a proud uh, Open University graduate. Those are the, the people who have seized the opportunity and made that vision uh, real. And Annabel Ewan was right when Harold Wilson uh, first talked of a university of the air, a virtual university without entry qualifications. The idea was derided and mocked by some, but what a powerful and transformative idea it was and how it has developed as society has changed. I, unlike uh, Oliver Mundell, I'm certainly old enough to remember uh, those uh, black and white beards, corduroys and kipper ties, uh, also featured, I think, in the television uh, uh, lectures of the early days. And it's important to remember that while the Open University now works through um, the modern technology of the internet and virtual reality, it still works very closely with the BBC, for example, in the production of important programmes uh, like The Blue Planet. Uh, Claire Baker mentioned that Jenny Lee uh, was very clear that the Open University should not be second best to traditional universities. Uh, and I think it's also worth noting that in one uh, uh, statistic in particular, and that is that 40% of Open University students study STEM subjects, and that 49% of those students are women. The Open University, frankly, is streets ahead uh, of the other institutions in the university sector today. But I want to close by, as Kenny Gibson did, uh, paying some acknowledgement to the, uh, the, the, the YAS programme, the Young Applicants uh, in School Scheme, because uh, some uh, years ago, back in 2015, uh, uh, there was an event in this parliament celebrating the success of the YAS program uh, in Scotland. And I was delighted that uh, one of the speakers there was Mary Livesey, uh, who was a student from Preston Lodge High School in my own constituency. Preston Lodge is one of the most active schools in the YAS program, which, as uh, Mr. Gibson described, gives uh, uh, S6 pupils the chance to study at a university level while still at school. And Mary was very clear about what a useful and powerful experience that was. So, new ideas all the time. Congratulations on the 50 years past and look forward to the 50 years to come. Stuart Stevenson, followed by Liam Kerr. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And firstly, uh, let me congratulate you as others have uh, Claire Baker and her relative. Uh, on uh, securing this debate and, of course, uh, wish the Open University uh, all the best on its uh, 50th birthday. Significant milestone, and I congratulate them on their work. Uh, the Labour Party has achievements that I can respect, and this is certainly one of them. Um, the days of the launch of the Open University uh, at home, we had a 12-inch black and white television, um, which... Uh, it uh, had one channel. Uh, it had been uh, originally purchased for uh, viewing the coronation in 1953. And when I left home, it had still uh, not been replaced. So the technology that we were using then is a world away from the technology every one of us has in our mobile phone to make, in technical terms, if not in content, uh, broadcastable uh, material. But the motto uh, of the Open University, be open, 
uh, is the important one, and that underpins the Open University's uh, academic strategy. But to, to be open to what? To people, places, methods, ideas, the very exemplification of inclusion and possibility. Be open to opportunity, be open uh, to inspiration. Uh, I myself did a short uh, focused course on systems behavior in 1972, and I still have the course book uh, from that course uh, sitting uh, among my other academic books uh, on my shelf. I admit it's been a little while since I got it off the shelf to revisit it, but it was a value to me at that time, and it contains uh, many truths uh, that uh, matter to me now. Uh, John F. Kennedy said the educated person knows that knowledge is power, more so today than ever before. He knows that only an educated and informed people will be a free people. The ignorance of one voter in a democracy impairs the security uh, of all. And the Open University is a very important part of helping people learn about society, learn about uh, a wide range of subjects, but more critically, perhaps, learn about how to keep learning uh, for the rest of their lives. And to be able to weave that learning process into your working life uh, through the Open University is very important indeed. Uh, the briefing the Open University has given us uh, highlights uh, a couple of things that are right up to the minute in terms of uh, uh, where we are now after 50 years. The Open Learn free website, 60 million visits so far and the massive uh, online, open online course, the Moog platform that they use, a very effective way of drawing people into the world uh, of learning uh, through the internet. Uh, that is important and of huge uh, value. There are people who've yet to find the Open University. Hopefully tonight's debate is part of spreading uh, the world. People whose talent and skills is as yet uh, undiscovered and who the traditional uh, methods of learning will simply uh, not reach. The Open University has been transformational for many. It will be transformational for many more. Now, education open to all in Scotland, we recognize the value of that through free education, um, they are important in delivering uh, education and to society as a whole. Like Ian Gray, I struggled with the self-discipline of full-time study. Uh, perhaps I didn't struggle as hard as Ian Gray. My mother was so relieved when I finally graduated that she bought my girlfriend a present because she knew who really had pushed me over the line at the end of it. But education for all, regardless of what road we take, must remain open to all. And the Open University is a vital part of our learning infrastructure uh, that supports that. Presiding officer. The last of the open debate contributions is from Liam Kerr. Thank you, presiding officer. <clears throat> I wanted to make a short and rather impromptu personal contribution to this debate, <clears throat> celebrating 50 years of the Open University. And I want to particularly focus on the accessibility and the open to all ethos. You see, the Open University claims to have 16,500 students in Scotland, and for more than a decade, I have been one of them. Uh, I took several years of flirting with the OU before, uh, and with the idea of study, before I actually committed to study with them. There were a number of questions in my mind, or reasons not to pick up the phone. Uh, could I afford it? Well, I discovered yes, because the courses are extraordinarily good value and there are loads of kind of grants and support schemes that one can avail oneself of. Would I need to pre-qualify for the courses I wanted to do? Well, generally the answer was no, because there's this open entry policy, which means there are no entrance qualifications required for the vast majority of courses. Did I have the time, given that in those days, I had a full-time legal job and then a young family. Well, again, it turned out yes, because, of course, the whole emphasis is on flexibility uh, and allowing you to study wherever and whenever it suited me. And then, of course, deep down, there was the question in my mind, would it be any good? Would the materials and the teaching be up to scratch? Well, emphatically, yes, 
This is the fourth university I've studied at, and whilst, to be fair to the others, uh, the other three were some considerable time ago, uh, the fact is that the materials and calibre of the teaching staff at the Open University are second to none. So I signed up to study, sometimes because I was just interested in the topic, sometimes to further my career, uh, sometimes both. And in that time, I have studied, amongst others, European history from 1400 to 1900, Upper Intermediate French, the weather, an MBA, and now crime and justice, which, as long as I don't do anything stupid in the next couple of months and get through the dissertation and final exam, will give me another honours degree. During that time, I've shared residentials with like-minded students of all ages, nationalities, and backgrounds in places like Warwick University, Cannes in northern France, and Brussels, as well as day schools at various universities. I've learned a huge amount and achieved qualifications which will help me both in here, uh, have helped me in my previous career, and no doubt will in the future. But above all, I've had great fun doing it. So, yes, I wanted to be here to celebrate 50 years of the Open University and to wish it all the best for the next 50 years, but I also wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you for all that it has done for me and to encourage anyone watching this debate who might be thinking about studying, perhaps for their career, for future opportunities, or just for the sheer joy of learning, to pick up the phone or go on the website and just see what's offered, because you won't regret it. Thank you. I now call Richard Lockhead to respond to the debate for around seven minutes, please, Minister. <clears throat> Thank you. First of all, many thanks to Claire Baker for bringing this motion uh, to Parliament and allowing us the opportunity to reflect on the Open University's many achievements in its first 50 years. And I think the number of speakers this evening and passionate contributions illustrates very well the high value that members attach to the Open University. So tonight's a great opportunity for us all to join together to wish the Open University a happy 50th birthday. I should say, of course, that 1969 is a vintage year and it's a tremendous year in which to be born, and I can speak from personal experience. And I was delighted that Oliver Mandel said at age 50, you can still be coming of age and be radical uh, and disruptive at the same time. So I very much took comfort from uh, Oliver Mandel's comments. Uh, but the university's first chancellor, Geoffrey Crowther, described the purpose of the Open University as one that was open first as to people, open as to places, open as to methods, and open finally to ideas. And this statement continues to define what sets the university, uh, Open University apart. And the growth of the university has been incredible. 25,000 places were available to students in its first year in 1971 when it started taking enrolments. And since then, the OU has welcomed over 2 million students across 157 countries. So that's a real phenomenal footprint across the globe in terms of promoting higher education. And 16,000 Scots, as one of the members mentioned, enrolled in 2017-18 alone, and 86% of those that enrolled went on to positive destinations thereafter. Many members have spoken about students and referred to some stories from their own lives or uh, their own constituencies. I should say that I had the privilege last year of attending the graduation ceremony of Ian Stephen, a student from Elgin who overcame the challenges of multiple disabilities to achieve a master's in science. And hearing from his friends and his family and fellow students uh, at the ceremony, I was left in absolutely no doubt about the scale of his achievements and the importance of the Open University in supporting him along his student journey. And I should say that the director of the Open University in Scotland, the formidable and impressive Susan Stewart, that many members have paid tribute to this evening, was there in Elgin with her team to take the ceremony, to have a home ceremony in Elgin so they could be there and ensure that Ian Stephen was able to have um, a graduation ceremony. So what we see today, though, is a clear example of what makes uh, this government and Scotland and Parliament proud of our universities. And as many members have said, the role of our universities have never been more important. Uh, we've got such a huge role in ensuring we have a highly educated and skilled population able to adapt to the needs of a rapidly changing economy, and that's vital to our country's future prosperity and our well-being. 
And that is why improving education and closing the attainment gap as well is our top priorities. A good education is important for its own sake, as Richard Leonard said, and it also contributes to the health and the happiness and fulfilment of both the individual and wider society. And it is clear from the contributions we have heard today from across Parliament that the Open University embraces those ambitions and shares a common purpose with Parliament and the Government. The, commissioning, the Commission on Widening Access was clear that all parts of the education system would have to work together to achieve the ambitious target of ensuring 20% of students entering university come from Scotland's 20% most deprived backgrounds by 2030. And social just, justice and equality of opportunity are at the heart of everything the Open University does, and widening access to higher education is the ambition on which it was founded. It has indeed blazed a trail as far as widening access is concerned, or, or uh, been ahead of the game in terms of what Gillian Martin is also referring to. And indeed, around a, of a fifth of its undergraduate entrants in Scotland join the Open University without typical higher education entrance qualifications and with a similar proportion also living in our 20% most deprived areas uh, in Scotland. And the OU's open admissions policy, flexible delivery, bridging programmes with schools, and articulation agreements with colleges and geographical reach demonstrates its commitment to that widening access agenda. The Commission on Widening Access also recognised that further work was required to support equal access for other groups of learners as well. Uh, therefore, we should commend this evening the Open University and its high proportion of undergraduate entrants with disabilities and the wide range of support services and facilities it has offered to those students. These examples provide clear evidence that they are getting something very right in terms of that unique, flexible approach to learning and the commitment to delivering education for all. Of course, as Claire Baker said, universities do operate in a globally competitive marketplace Global shifts to an economy increasingly based on the knowledge and skills makes the contribution of our universities very pivotal to the country's future success. We all know that Scotland is an open, welcoming and inclusive country. We need to ensure that our universities can continue to compete globally and that's why it is important to note that, that over 7,000 international students are directly studying with the Open University. And the Open University's long-standing partnership with the BBC and its development of open educational resources, again, that many members have referred to, has allowed it to reach a global audience. And OpenLearn, the OU's free learning resource website, has over 58 million visits uh, since it launched in 2006. And in that global context, the government is also fully aware of the value of STEM learning to Scotland's intellectual and economic future and recognises that STEM is a key tool in solving many of the big issues facing the planet. So, like Ian Gray, I, I also welcome the fact that over 40% of the OU students in Scotland are studying STEM subjects, and Ian Gray made an important point that a high proportion of those students are, are female. Another of the Open University strengths lies in its delivery of high-quality, flexible work-based learning, which is imperative to, again, the future of the Scottish economy. And in Scotland, we all know about the expansion of graduate apprenticeships, and that provides more opportunities for people to combine their academic degree with learning in the workplace. And the OU has adapted likewise to employer needs, incorporating its open, uh, open educational resources in the workplace and collaborating with Skills Development Scotland to offer graduate apprenticeships in cybersecurity, IT, business management, and software development. So again, Open University recognises the value of allowing students to work and learn at the same time with around three quarters of its students in Scotland in full or part-time employment. We're running out of time. There's many other areas I could highlight for the Open University are playing such an important role in the very important agendas in higher education in this century. But I think we should finish by saying that Claire Baker did remind us of the importance of the renowned Scottish MP Jenny Lee, the daughter of a coal miner from Fife and student of Edinburgh University, whose vision and tenacity was crucial to establishing the Open University that millions have benefited from over the past 50 years. So I, as the Minister, I'm confident that this institution will continue to build on Jenny Lee's legacy and match her determination to provide education to future generations of all backgrounds who wish to realise their ambitions and fulfil their potential. So let me, on behalf of the Scottish Parliament, thank the Open University, uh, all the students, the tutors, the staff, for all their considerable contributions to our country's growth and well-being, and wish them well for this year's celebrations and their continuing endeavours. Thank you.
That concludes the debate and this meeting is closed. You may show your appreciation now. <laughs>